Hey everybody, it's Professor Diffley of this History 100, Chapter 1, Lecture Video 4. <clears throat> so this is the fourth video uh, for Chapter 1. Chapter 1 is pretty long, so uh, sorry, there is more videos in this chapter, lecture videos, uh, than pretty much any going forward. All right, so here's where we're picking up in Lecture uh, 4 for Chapter 1, uh, Mesopotamian Economy. Uh, overall, uh, really a agra agrarian agricultural um uh, Economy, some light manufacturing and mining for uh, metals, uh, some uh, you know um, producing goods, usually pottery, weapons, that sort of thing, tools. Uh, but mostly, uh, it is um, uh, uh, agricultural. Uh, that is the wealth. That's what they're growing. That is the basis of wealth uh, in this area. Um, others, it's redistributive economy. What does that mean? Uh, technically, the uh, king monarch uh, uh, ran and controlled everything. So the way it worked is. Um, Farmers, uh, uh, everybody would produce stuff, and we'd then go to the palace, and the palace would redistribute it the way they saw fit. This way for the king to uh, be in charge, right? You give favors, you give goods to those who are loyal to you and those who are not, right? It's an unfair system, but uh, an unequal, uh, undoubtedly. Um, uh, but that is the economic system there. Uh, taxes, this is true for most of human history. Taxes were paid in labor or goods, uh, not in coin, you know, cash, uh, labor or goods usually there. Uh, hierarchy here um, in Mes ancient Mesopotamia, uh, very hierarchical, like a pyramid. Uh, again, hierarchy is where there are different um, tiers, right? Uh, uh, the higher up you are on this list, the more power you have at uh, the bottom, obviously uh, the least there. Um, the top were the kings and his nobles and uh, uh, religious families, um, uh, religious officials. Nobles are upper class, uh, elite families, um, uh, uh, nobility passes uh, by, you know, status of birth, right? Uh, so it goes there. And these were those that helped the king uh, rule. They were the most powerful. Uh, the religious officials were also the chief priests and all that were also uh, uh, very powerful, and they supported the king as well. So the king and his family, then uh, ruling families and religious fish officials underneath him, but uh, he is at the top. Uh, the middle uh, is the free peoples, right? These are merchants, craftsmen, uh, some farmers, uh, and others uh, that, that provide a service that uh, was deemed essential, and they were free peoples. And we see this, that's what they refer to in the historical record. In the very bottom, you had slaves. Um, you know, Sumer you'll find slavery everywhere in human history, unfortunately. Um, Sumerian slavery um, was more of a punishment for a crime uh, rather than anything based on religion, race, anything, color, skin, anything like that. Um, Sumerian slaves are, they're, they're widely used um, and found everywhere again. Um, but in Sumeria, uh, ways of becoming enslaved, you owed a debt, captured in war, committed a crime, that sort of thing. And slavery was not perpetual. It didn't last forever. It was something uh, that could um, uh, be bought off or, uh, you know, you served your sentence sort of thing. Uh, that's what uh, a slave in this system would be. Um, oop, uh, skipped one. Uh, religion and mythology in uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Make sure you look at the Crash Course video on this. Uh, this uh, That video will actually cover uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt in detail, and you're going to get uh, the information from the text, but uh, really uh, from those videos. Well, I'll say here is that uh, they were polytheistic. Uh, they had hundreds of gods. Uh, again, everything had uh, every sphere of activity, every trade, every natural phenomena had a god associated with it. Um, and so their gods uh, were, uh, they're, you know, uh, gods in their one religion, there was hundreds, at least hundreds, if not thousands of them. Um, uh, you know, and, they, and all across Mesopotamia, they shared the same pantheon of gods, right? They had the same gods. Uh, but every city uh, state had its own patron god or goddess. So uh, right, they were all part of the same religion, but uh, certain cities might worship one god over another, and that was the patron who took care of that city. Uh, you're going to find that uh, through the ancient Greeks and beyond. Uh, so, um, so you know, uh, the city state is also a religious community, right? Um, you had the city god, uh, city state god, uh, the patron god. You had to worship them, but you could also worship other gods as long as that god was uh, the chief uh, patron god or goddess there. Um, and again, you had uh, 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 deities for everything. People even had their own personal gods who protected them and then interceded with them, like almost like a guardian angel, uh, to use a modern uh, Western uh, reference here. Um, you know, the, uh, everybody did. And, you know, the way you pr prayed um, to is different. You didn't go to temples uh, or, or churches. You, didn't, you know, you had temples there, but they were the homes of the gods. We'll see that with the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, but you worshipped in your field, your home, that sort of thing. Um, you know, what were the most important gods? Uh, usually depending on what was the most powerful, most important um, uh, thing in that in the area. So Enki, the Mesopotamian god of water, is often one of the highest because water is important for farming, all that uh, there. Um, but again, you'll see the rest on the video there. Uh, this is the ziggurat, the stepped pyramid temples. Um, 
uh, in Mesopotamia. These are the ruins of one. Uh, here's uh, uh, some ruins uh, and what it looked like beforehand. Uh, you know, uh, by modern standards, they're not the biggest buildings in the world, but back then they were gigantic, right? And showed uh, 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 the uh, sort of, you know, how much uh, devotion to the gods. It's also, you know, part a set piece, right? You have the priest and the king up top there looking down upon, upon the people, everybody looking up at them. So, you know, it's part political theater and all that as well. Uh, but, yeah, these step pyramids, why not a normal pyramid like you see in Egypt? Uh, much more difficult to build. Uh, you know, most of these, these step pyramids, uh, the bigger base uh, you have um, to start with, the higher you can build, the more secure it's going to be, that sort of thing. Uh, there, and again, here's the ziggurat at Ur. And you can see a human being up there. So it gives you somewhat of the scale there. Uh, definitely big. Nonetheless, uh, views of the gods. Um, one thing about the Mesopotamians, um, and this is going to be something to contrast. I'll look at the different ways the uh, Egyptians and uh, Sumerians viewed their gods and how they acted. Uh, Mesopotamians viewed um, and Sumerians viewed their gods as similar to humans, but with extreme emotions. Right? Uh, they got jealous. They got angry. They could love. They could hate, but in greater, uh, uh, uh you know, range than uh, humans. Um, and these gods are angry and vengeful, and they could bring destruction and pe on people um, and others, often by floods uh, and dis, dis you know, if you showed disrespect. So that's the thing. You had to please the god. You had to keep them happy. If you showed them disrespect, they got angry. They could just smite everybody, send in a f devastating flood that would wipe out everything. Um, and that's what you would see there. So you had to please the gods. Uh, you know, this is different than the way we often view gods. Uh, why do they view this as their gods as angry and uh, vengeful and, uh, you, you know, uh, fickle? Uh, well, that's the world they live in, right? Um, there's wars all the time. Uh, floods come all the time and destroy everything. Um, and so, yeah, you but you're looking for a reason why this is happening. They look to the gods and they must have... Yeah, you know, uh, displease the gods in some way for all of this to happen. There. Um, uh, and you know, and so uh, you're gonna find that everywhere. One of the things too with the displeasing gods. I mean, you see this in the Epic of Gilgamesh and others. Uh, the uh, flood story from uh, you know um, uh, of Noah and the uh, uh, the flood. No, in the ark. Um, that that uh, story predated uh, uh, Christianity, Judaism uh, by thousands of years. Uh, you can find in the earliest known literature, which is um, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, you can find flood stories of it, and it's almost exactly the same story. God, uh, a deity comes to a person, tells them to gather all the animals, build a boat, ride out the storm that's going to uh, get rid of uh, humanity. So why, again, floods, uh, destructive, uh, you know, seemingly world-ending floods happened a lot areas. Um, the other thing, cuneiform, this, so this is their form of writing. Cuneiform is the first form of writing that we have. Um, it's called cuneiform because it means wedge-shaped writing. It's because of the uh, way they um, wrote here, these wedges. They would cut reeds, you know, like long grasses, and they would press that into a soft clay and then harden the clay there. Um, here's a, you know, cuneiform. At first, it just, it started as more us uh, uh, representing, oop, didn't mean to do that, uh, representing uh, symbols and then you know like a head that that the top one actually kind of looks like a head that looks like a cow's head uh, turned sideways that could look like a fish um down at the bottom carp um uh, uh, but they change over time from rather just being a um a symbol to mean a concept they can turn change into sounds and it lets the uh, uh language grow and uh, uh to be written in other ways but yeah cuneiform is the first way uh here and so um and some more examples of it, this wedge-shaped uh, writing. So uh, cuneiform um, you know, helps spread ideas. Why is writing so important? It helps you uh, keep track of ideas, pass them on to generations. Um, you know, Not everything then has to be learned, right? If I have, say, one person, you're a hunter-gatherer, one person has all the knowledge, they die, that knowledge dies with them unless they've given it out. You know, But if they've written it down, it can be passed on uh, more easily to others. And that's a view. Uh, why did Sumerians uh, and them create writing? Well, the first writing that we find is actually about bookkeeping, right? Accounting. Uh, who owes what to whom? Who owns what? That sort of thing. That was the first writing. You had to keep records of what, uh, you know, for the king, uh, for farmers, for other things. That was the first writing. And that was you know, really just record keeping, uh, bookkeeping. And then later it goes uh, and, and develops into you can record stories and, and all sorts of other things from that. Um, so not everybody knew how to write. It's really not until modern times where you get a ma majority of people who are literate. Uh, you had scribes. These were people who, uh, oh, going back, sorry, the scribes, uh, these were, uh, you know, people who were trained in writing. Remember, uh, you know, there's a special class of people. It takes training. Uh, everybody else, there's no education system. So these are the elite. They have the time to be able to uh, focus on writing rather than, you know, surviving, that sort of thing. Um, and then they, you know, go through all this training uh, to control uh, writing and that. 
Um, here's a uh, Gilgamesh uh, in cuneiform, and this actually part of it uh, covers the flood story there. And this is a depiction of Gilgamesh. You can see this; uh, it's discussed in the text and others. Uh, this is just an, uh, the flood excerpt uh, from the Epic of Gilgamesh. You can see this in the regular slides uh, there. Um, you can also see, um, yeah, war constant uh, um, in this area. And you see this here; these are early depictions of their war machines, uh, soldiers up top with spears. Uh, uh, humans riding on uh, chariots, pulling horses. Look, they uh, ran over some horse all here. Um, and that. And so this is, uh, yeah, just early depictions of their war. Um, these are, you know, uh, for the upper class, you can tell they're made of uh, uh, finer metals uh, and that this uh, female's uh, queen's uh, headdress and earrings. This was a male uh, uh, king's uh, sort of ceremony. It, uh, and that. Um, but it's also in these areas where you're going to see the first empires. An empire then, what's an empire? Empire is when one area takes over another and controls it at its own, right? So it would be if Ur took over Ur -Ark and Eridu and ruled all those three cities as one, that would be an empire, right? Because it's controlling an area outside of its own and ruling it. And these are the first empires you get here. And we're going to go through a few of them here, but there's a video on the Assyrians who are the most important uh, from this era. Uh, and so make sure you watch that uh, uh, video on uh, Blackboard, the required video on the Assyrians. Um, but these are the first empires. They're short-lived. Why? It's really hard to control uh, large amounts of territory in these areas um, because of the lack of communication, lack of logistics, that sort of thing. Uh, this is uh, where you see him. So this, you know, this map we saw before uh, depicts the region, you know, Mesopotamia, uh, Fertile Crescent, Sumeria is what Babylon would be, uh, the Assyrians up there, um, and city-states, that whole thing right there. So you can see there. And then, you know, next we're going to move into Egypt in this uh, chapter, and then we're going to move up to the Hittites there. Uh, these are the major first three civilizations, uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, and the Hittites here in Anatolia. Um, so the Akkadians, uh, they created the first uh, empire by force, uh, right? So they conquered others, uh, led by the king Sargon. Uh, goals of conquest really controlled metal production, metal mining, and production of weapons. Why? Well, if you control the metals that make all the tools and weapons and the wealth, you're in power there. And so that's their goals of their consequence. Uh, consequences of these, um, oh, that's the goals of their conquest. Consequences is uh, actually, you know, uh, it begins to spread uh, cuneiform. That's one of the uh, things that come out of this. It spreads cuneiform, uh, and now it's adapted and adopted by other places as well. Uh, you get Ur, they build a centralized uh, 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 economy. This is a, uh, you know, a couple things that you see in the Ur dynasty here um, is uh, they established a, a, a law code. And uh, the creation of divine right. What is the divine right theory of monarchy is? Is uh, the gods have given the king the right to uh, rule, right? How do we know the god gave the king the right to rule? Well, the king says so, the priest said so. Uh, often the argument was, gods don't make mistakes. I am in charge. If God did not want me in charge, he would not have put me in power, right? Because God is only, I know it's not the best logic, but it apparently worked uh, for some there. Uh, the Assyrians, again, this is a trade-based empire, very um, powerful, very brutal as well. And you can see this on the uh, videos. Um, but, you know, one of the big things is they would forcibly uproot entire populations and move them around as they saw fit for that to help uh, the empire. Uh, this is the earliest uh, law, one of the earliest law codes, uh, King Hammurabi's, uh, Code of Hammurabi here. Uh, concept of justice, this is different. It's social hierarchy, not justice. Usually means everybody's treated equally. This meant you treated everybody equally depending upon their social class, right? So the upper class has got one form of punishment, lower's got uh, different forms of punishment. Um, nature decided justice, right? Sometimes they would let it... Uh, you know, uh, battle battle it out, let nature, you know, you, one old way was you hold an iron rod, a hot iron rod, uh, and then don't treat the burns. If you don't die from an infection, you're, uh, you're you're not guilty. If you did die, you're guilty, that sort of thing. But eye for an eye, very much so, right? Literally, some of it says there is that um, if, uh, you know, uh, you cause someone else to lose an eye, they can make you lose an eye, that sort of thing. So that's what the eye for an eye justice meant in Kota Hammurabi. I um, mean, you see it here. Uh, is the uh, depiction of it uh, on the clay tablet. Well, I put it out there so everybody knows the rules, everybody can hold me accountable. But it also says in the Code of Hammurabi that um, who's in charge of enforcing these rules? Well, gods have put King Hammurabi in charge. So this is also propaganda.
All right, so in the, um, the, this is where we're ending there. In the next video, we're going to pick up with the Hittites. Uh, why? Uh, there are slides in the full lecture slide on Egypt, and they have notes on them. Uh, but there's also a great video for Egypt there. And what you're going to rely on is the crash course video on Egypt. I will mention again in the next video, but we're going to move on in the next video with the Hittites. Uh, Egypt is in a crash course video.